Welcome back, AP. Um, oh, well, let's go ahead and kick it off. Uh, just give you a couple heads up kind of things. Oh, that's not hair. That's the split on the table. Sorry about that. Uh, to give you a quick heads up about like how this was supposed to work out, so sorry for conf confusing y'all so much. Um, but every time I reference Middle Ages art and then talk about an artist's name, the artist is from the Renaissance, all right? So when I was talking about Middle Ages paintings or portraits, and then I moved into Giotto and Della Francesca, I was saying that Giotto and Della Francesca are actually early Renaissance artists, right? Did the same thing with sculpture, right? When I talked about medieval sculpture and then I moved into Donatello. Donatello is a Renaissance artist. So like put stars next to the Renaissance artist, the names, and then you'll just kind of know like those are Renaissance figures. I was trying my best to show that there's like a shift from middle evil and mi middle evil. Medieval, Middle Ages intelligence, kind of like what uh, Petrarch was advocating for, um, the idea that this is the Dark Ages, we're now moving into the light. Um, I was trying my best to show that. Uh, apologies for being so confusing about it. Uh, but anyway, let's get after it. We left off here um, in class, we we're talking about Gothic architecture, which is actually like uh, your Middle Age architectural standard, Romanesque and gar Gothic architecture are. Romanesque just means it looks Roman right so it's got pitched roofs possibly some columns maybe some archways just very simple uh, architectural schemes that, that have been used for a really long time uh gothic architecture though we made it, started making a list in class right we we're talking about how gothic architecture is represented by like everything comes to a point lucas we talked about how the flying buttresses anthony o'toole right and to give you a heads up really quick uh that's a terrible picture of me that's a flying buttress right there, right? These are the things that actually hold the roof up from the outside, so you can have a vaulted ceiling like that. Right, Denny? Very, very nice. And then one thing that we didn't really get a chance to go over is other little, like, holdouts from uh, the old Roman period and stuff like that. So this is just a story really quick to give you an idea of, like, what Middle Ages intelligence and architecture was a lot like. So this actually is on St. Peter's Cathedral in Vienna. Um, and it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful cathedral, and it's one of my favorite buildings I've ever seen. Now, as you can see, these little slits right here, this whole entranceway to the church actually used to be the gate to the easternmost area of the Roman Empire at the time, and then they built the cathedral off the back of that gate, right? Well, crazy thing that actually used to hang from these two little holes right here, there used to be these two metal brackets that hung there, holding up a gigantic bone. Like one of the biggest bones you've ever seen, right? A bone that's probably longer than your dinner table. Absolutely enormous. And why they actually hung that thing up there is because a lot of the priests, and this is during the Middle Ages in like the 1100s, um, the priests always used to advocate for how there used to be giants like Goliath that used to roam the world and things like that, right? And as proof of these giants' existence, they were like, oh my God, someone found this huge bone. This is proof that God was right and the Bible says exactly what it's supposed to. Turns out, Jules Berry will like this one, turns out that the giant bone was actually just a woolly mammoth bone. So they actually had discovered a fossil and had no idea they actually had found a giant hairy elephant bone. So anyway, but of course that's your flying buttresses, your vaulted ceilings, Shane Slack, your stained glass windows, right? Uh, so also, as you can see right here, some of our Middle Ages sculpture, right? Altar pieces, fully clothed figures sucked into the wall, right? Now, anyway, getting into it though, we got to talk about the main chief architect out of all of them. Really fast before we get there, though, I want to talk about like adornments and just kind of early phases moving into Renaissance architecture. So Ghiberti, Renaissance architect and bronze sculptor, right? He is an architect and bronze sculptor. Now, his biggest contribution to the architectural sphere was actually his Gates of Paradise, right? So the gates of paradise are actually going to relate to the building that we're about to talk about in about two seconds when we talk about the um, Santa Maria del Fiore and the dome on top of it that Brunelleschi. All right, we're going to talk about Brunelleschi's dome today. Actually, like he was the one that um, designed and had constructed, right? So these right here are the gates of paradise. It's a very, very cool set of doors that were actually cast for the baptistry that's across, directly across the courtyard from Brunelleschi's dome in the Cathedral of Santa Santa Maria del Fiore, right? Saint Mar or Saint Saint Mary of Flowers is what it means in English. Now the Gates of Paradise, though, are bronze gilded doors that have ten panels apiece, right? And they actually picture scenes from the Old Testament, right? 
So very cool stuff, for example, the Exodus is actually involved in here. Um, a lot of different imagery and a lot of the very famous stories from the uh, Old Testament are pictured on these bronze doors. These actually served as one of the biggest inspirations for Michelangelo to get into sculpture. It also serves as a very good like semblance of bronze sculpting and bronze casting. Right? It also serves as a very, very solid example of architecture, showing the adornment and a new step forward in architecture as a doorway or an entranceway. Right? One of the funniest things I find about it is all these little busts that actually symbolize characters in these scenes, and they're kind of like sticking their heads out like that. You can see them right here. Um, very, very neat, though. Uh, really always been a fan of these. I actually, in that very first picture that you saw where I didn't know what to do with my hands, I covered my face, I'm actually standing in front of these. These are the gates of paradise, right? And that's by Ghiberti. Now, Ghiberti's ultimate rival is this guy, Brunelleschi, right? And is, of course, best known for Brunelleschi's dome, right? So, Brunelleschi, Filippo Brunelleschi, F-I-L-I-P-P-O, Filippo Brunelleschi, um, actually didn't receive a lot of uh, commissions early on in his career. One of the earliest commissions he actually received was this. It was a hospital for orphans, right? It's um, called the Hospital, of in or hospital for the Innocents, right? And you can see some, like, retracting back to some other Romanesque styles with the pitched entries ways of the um, the vaulted, or excuse me, the pinched, pitched vaults, sorry about that, uh, that symbolize like, the pitched roofing that was used in Roman architecture, the archways and entrance ways, the symmet or symmetrical style of the building. It's a very solid building. It serves as some of his, a good example of his early work, mainly because actually Filippo did a lot of study of a lot of old ancient Roman ruins. And he really wanted to actually try and replicate a lot of these things. However, your Gothic architecture is not very progressive, in a sense, right? Um, because if you go back and you look at, like, for example, the Pantheon, which is in Rome, the, one of the largest domes in the world, it's still not quite what he was looking for. But then he was commissioned to design this guy right here, his dome, right? This is actually it's seen at night. This is it during the daytime. These are pictures that I took, but this is it in full view, right? Brunelleschi's dome was a massive leap forward in architecture due to the fact that actually half of the thing was designed in Romanesque Gothic style, and then he finished the entire like back end of it in Renaissance style architecture with a freestanding masonry dome, right? Now, the amazing things about his dome, though, is he actually created it in a very, very different style shape. It actually has a pointed fifth up here. It points actually up more towards the top. It looks more like an egg shape, right? He actually used an egg to try and symbolize his intelligence over the other competing architects that he was going up against. He actually asked the, the competitors at the Opera del Duomo, the guys, so the Opera del Duomo was the commission that was in charge of actually relegating, designing, and offering up the money for the dome. And he challenged him. He's like, look, I tell you what, any of us who can make an egg stand on its end, that's who will get the, the dome commission, right? That person will be allowed to construct the dome. And a lot of the other architects were very viable options. They were doing really, really good, but they couldn't make the egg stand up. So he takes the egg and he cracks it a little bit and he sits it up. And he's like, I never said you couldn't crack it. Not, so anyway, but he received the commission. And to this day, it is still the largest standing Freemasonry dome in the world. And I don't mean Freemasons like the... Uh, Illuminati. I mean Freemasons, like as in freestanding masonry dome, right? And it has a lot of amazing different design qualities. Uh, first of all, it was just a giant hole there up until the early 1400s when he actually began construction. And it was, the construction of the entire cathedral actually began, began almost 200 years earlier. And so for t almost 200 years, it was just a giant hole over top of where they wanted to give mass. And one of the amazing things about this is there's actually two domes, one inside of the other. There's an outer shell and then an inner shell. And the inner shell is actually designed to try and counteract this stuff called hoop stress. So whenever you build a dome, all of the stress wants to go outwards towards these bands. And so he used sandstone chains and wooden chains to try and actually reinforce the areas of the dome. And it is an absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful building. It's one of my, like, I cried when I saw it. Um, much like a lot of stuff I've seen in history, but still. Uh, so as you can see right here, though, it's got the early Gothic styles up front, except for the uh, circular portals that actually provide light. But that right there is what the inside of the dome looks like following its painting. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful fresco. Uh, I can't remember exactly who designed it. Um, I have to look that up again. 
But this is the section I was talking about where actually only the priests can see these while they're giving mass. It's actually Satan eating. It's Dante's version of Satan eating Judas, Crassus, and uh, Brutus, right? And then up here, actually, in the like, it's supposed to be the last judgment and everyone ascending into heaven in the levels of heaven uh, as you go up. And then God is actually up here with some of the most esteemed prophets. Uh, it's one of my favorite things I've ever seen. It's amazingly gorgeous. Now we're getting into our northern early Renaissance figures, right? So we've talked about a lot of people. We talked about Giotto, Piera della Francesca, Donatello, Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, right? Now you need to know, like, Ghiberti, he's a sculptor and an architect. Um, also, like, an old goldsmith is what he actually trained as, but so is Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi's an architect. Donatello is a sculptor. And then we have uh, Giotto and Della Francesca, our early painters and fresco artists. Now we're going to move into a different medium a little bit. And we're talking about northern art during the early Renaissance. We're talking about anything outside of Italy. Now, a lot of people actually attribute the northern Renaissance as happening immediately after the, high, or the Renaissance in Italy. It's not necessarily true. It did come slightly after in its beginnings, but the biggest thing about it is their styles are massively different, right? So we've got no Middle Ages versions of Northern art. We're getting straight into our Renaissance guys, right? So Jan van Eyck is actually one of the most famous ones, and he is Dutch, right? Both the guys we're about to talk about are actually Dutch. And go figure. Actually, to give you a heads up in your notes somewhere, just jot this down. When you talk about the Dutch from the English perspective, you call them the low countries, all right? So just to keep your heads up. Now, Jan van Eyck, very, very famous figure, especially in the Netherlands. And he's a great example of Northern renaissance styles uh due to the fact that he actually embellishes much more ideas of these things called realism right r-e-a-l well, realism it's just realism right so realists especially during the northern renaissance period actually focus much more on portraying uh who is that is that keo yeah you're about to be on youtube now <laughs> yeah. so northern renaissance artists actually were proliferated the ideas of, I can't, this is really awkward now. Like, you're just walking around, and I see you on the you're other side. This is the men's faculty. You know what, Terry? You know what? No, you can use that. No. Go ahead. No, it's no. fine. No. No. <laughs> they can't. They're going to do the whole thing over. <laughs> no, I'm totally using it. So, anyway. Um, <laughs> Jan van Eyck actually portrayed these ideas of realism, showing more realistic figures, a lot of non-secular people, right? His most famous work of art is actually this guy right here. It's called the Arnolfini Portrait, right? The Arnolfini Portrait, which was actually supposedly designed for a couple upon their wedding. Now, this also, big northern change-up, right? The difference between northern and Italian art is actually phenomenally important in the sense of the use of color is not nearly as prolific in northern art as it is in Italian art. The use of... Uh, Trying to use very small qualities to expose real-life uh, scenes and scenarios. Lighting being used in a lot of different senses. A lot of your northern art is much darker. Uh, it actually and it uses low light as opposed to high-lit scenes, right? Also, it tries to portray realistic figures, real people, right? People that are not necessarily connected with the church, right? Now, that is particularly factual of this painting due to the fact, of course, it's just rife with symbolism. Now, we're going to pick up here uh, tomorrow, and then we're going to get into a lot of our other, like, we're going to finish up our early Renaissance artists, and then we're going to kind of blow quickly through all of the famous high Renaissance people that you already know of, right? We'll just kind of list them real fast and, like, jot like, their little stuff down. I see us finishing the art tomorrow. And then I see us getting into the politics and the Renaissance papacy era the next day. I see us having either our first test either by the end of the week on Friday or possibly Monday. All right, so we'll talk more about it then. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Very good stuff today. We went through Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, differences in Northern and Italian early Renaissance art, and then also Jan von Eyck, right, as an example. But now, tomorrow we're going to get into Roger von der Wieden, and then we're going to talk about some other things as well. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good evening.